So we'll go a little bit back before I Okay, move it's about uh, shortly after um, my second teacher died, I started to get these recurring dreams. It kept coming back over and over and over again. And in this dream, uh, a man would approach me. I never saw a face, but he would embrace me. And as soon as I felt the embrace around me, it was, uh, I felt this incredible peace. It was such incredible silence that I would completely melt into it. So I, I had this, um, and this dream would come over and over again. And it would be um, to the point that I could almost, it was so tangible that sometimes I would go wash the dishes and I would feel the same I, presence behind me and I would look around and, but there was no one. And I, I didn't see a face. By this time, I was almost 18 years single, alone, and I was starting to feel like it's time to, to find a partner. I was starting to want it again. And, um, and I always felt that, how would I know, the way I would know who the right person is, is by it, when the, this man would hug me, I would know, I would recognize him, that that's what I was looking for. I didn't understand the dream. I didn't understand what this peace was. All I knew is it felt so good. So, and about a few years after that, um, I got into Abraham Hicks, and I wanted to do Law of Attraction because I wanted to improve my life. I made a list of what I want in a man and what I don't want in a man. I got <laughs> into all of these things. And then... Um, one day, uh, a friend of mine wanted me to start a meetup, which is a, a online, you meet friends, and you meet together if you have something in common. So she said, why don't you do an Abraham Hicks meetup? And we'll meet people who are interested in Abraham Hicks. And I didn't want to do it because I was so tired of, of um, organizing things, and I didn't want to belong to anything anymore. But she didn't have a credit card, so I said, okay. <laughs> and one day I get this email and, uh, from a man, and he says, uh, I can't come to the meeting, but how would you like to go for a coffee? And I thought, well, this is odd. But then I saw his name in the bottom. It was Gabor Harshani. And I thought, wow, what a strong name. And I thought, oh, this man must be Persian. This might be very interesting. So I said, okay. So we decided to meet at Starbucks. So I'm going to Starbucks, and I'm waiting and waiting and waiting, looking around to find some tall, dark, and handsome <laughs> dude. <laughs> All of a sudden, Gabor comes and he says, are you Nareed? I, I never saw his picture. He saw mine. So I was very surprised. And I said, oh, I thought you were going to be Persian. <laughs> he said, no, I'm um, Hungarian. So we sat and we talked, and it was amazing to find how many things we had in common. I had a spiritual background, he had a spiritual background, he studied other things. But we had so much to talk about. And we went out for about a month. And I was amazed to find somebody who listens the way he does. I've never met anyone who actually listens People always interrupt, or they're thinking about what they want to say while you're talking and all of that. This man never interrupted. He was just there. He was just present, and I felt I can say anything. And he was just there. And uh, I also noticed that he never tried to impress me. I wasn't sure if that was a good thing or not. I was like, well, maybe he doesn't like me. But... He just never tried to impress me. I was the one who tried to impress him. I thought I was had all these spiritual teachings in my background, you know. And he just listened. But after a month, I, I, I found that uh, I had other issues with him. First of all, I wasn't with a man for a long time. And then I noticed that he wore s s sandals with socks. I said, who, who wears sandals with socks? And then he wore the same shirt twice, for two dates in a row, the same shirt. And he lived in Chinatown. I said, who is this man? You know, I haven't been with a man for so long, and I don't know about this guy. So 
I backed off. But what happened was that within the next two and a half years, we kept bumping into each other, either at singles parties or at, uh, at spiritual teach um, lectures and stuff like that. And one day we met at a barbecue <clears throat> and we started talking and it was wonderful because we could always speak about spiritual things that were interested, interesting because I, I didn't find anyone else interesting ever. I, I dated other guys but everybody wanted to talk about how they're renovating their basement or, or how their grandchildren are doing or stuff like that and I, I just I couldn't get anyone to talk to me about something real. And we started talking about what his his uh, what he was doing spiritually and what I was doing spiritually. And at some point I asked him, so okay, so you're present. So now what? My mind couldn't wrap itself around what does it mean? What do you mean present? What do you do with that? And looking back today I realized of course I couldn't. The mind doesn't know what presence is any more than it knows what it is. And then he said to me something that really shocked me. It was the first shock that I had with him was he said and, and it wasn't in a judgmental way, it was a very matter of fact. He said the difference between what you do and what I do is that what, what you're doing with the law of attraction and the teachings that you have it's, it's nothing wrong with it but it's all in the mind whereas what I do is not in the mind it's just presence and it's not in the mind I was so agitated I thought how could this be I was just spent 15 years with a teacher that talked about transcending the mind and talking about not, you're not <laughs> the mind and going beyond the mind and I was sure that what I was learning and what I was talking about was not in the mind. But then of course the mind doesn't know what is beyond the mind. The mind doesn't see the mind. But I still didn't get it at that point. I was just very, very agitated. So he saw that and he said, well, let's just agree to disagree. I said, okay. And we met one more time. But still, you know, the same Tiva sandals with the socks and the same shirt and <laughs> I don't know. I, I came home and I said, no, not for me. Time goes by. Two, two and a half years later, I get this feeling in me. I have to call him. I have to call Gabor. I don't know why, but I need to talk to him. Even if nothing happens, at least we'll be friends. And then the other voice would come in. Oh, no, you're, you're, you're a woman. You don't call a man. You, you've been practicing to be a monk. Uh, you, you, you don't, you've been alone for 18 years. You can't do that. And this is going on and on for three weeks. And one day I'm sitting at lunch at work. And uh, I, first, I called my daughter first. And I said, you know, I really want to call him, but I don't know what to do. She said, ah, Mom, just call him. <laughs> so I said, okay. Hung up the phone and called him. And it was a, a most wonderful conversation, and we decided to meet that evening. So I was going to pick him up. I went into with my car. I had a car at that time, and I went. I drove. Suddenly, in the middle of the of my of my route, I stopped and parked at a school parking lot. It suddenly dawned on me that the only reason it's not I haven't clicked with this man is because I keep judging him. I don't like his shirt, I don't like his shirt. It's like all these things I have about him. So I sat down and it was kind of like a meditation, I don't know what to call it, but I, I decided that I'm going to go to the meeting without any thought whatsoever and without any judgment. No matter what happens, it's going to be okay. I'm just going to look at it, not as good and not as bad. No commentary. No thought, no nothing. So I sat there and I just, for 10 minutes, I just decided to feel. I didn't know what I was doing. And I decided I'm not going to think. And I started to dissolve, all thoughts dissolving, dissolving, dissolving. And I'm just feeling and feeling and feeling. And by the time I got to the meeting, went to dinner, it was wonderful. 
at some point he teased me because I was trying to boast about um, some course that I took where we learned to, to do two-pointing, which is when you, you focus on, on, on two points and you do a, some kind of healing that way. I don't want to get into it, but at the, which point is, oh, two-pointing, two-pointing. <laughs> And being a nice, uh, nice, uh, pious woman, <laughs> I, I started to feel this thing coming up. Yeah. I said, no, you remember what you promised yourself. I made a commitment for myself. And I, I, I put an end to that. And I realized today that that was the best decision I've ever made in my life. Not just because of what transpired afterwards as a result now now that we're together but what it taught me is that nothing good comes from thinking real fruit real benefits come when your mind stops a real manifestation the true manifestation comes when the mind stops and then oh, uh, after dinner we went to my place and he gave me a hug and it was the exact same stillness and same peace that I felt in all those dreams and I knew this was the man and I knew that the only reason I didn't recognize it for the last two and a half years is because my mind interfered that's when I realized what a, 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 an important decision was not just for that moment but for the rest of my life to remember that when the mind interferes, we don't see what's right in front of us. We don't. We can't feel what's in our hearts. Shortly after that, uh, I, I said to him that um, I know. I, I felt that he had something special. That he he knew something that I was looking for. I didn't know what it was. I said, I can feel it. I don't know what it is, but I can feel it. And I said, I've been with a lot of fake teachers. In fact, my ex-husband was a fake teacher. So I know fake when I see it. Nobody can fool me anymore. But when I look at you, I know you're not fake. There's something about you that I know is true, even though I don't know what it is. And I can't explain what I feel, but it's for, I know it's for real. So he taught me what he teaches today to everybody, the simplicity of it, which was, feel your hand. I looked into his eyes. We looked at each other. And I felt my hands. I felt my feet. And then I started to feel what he was, what he was calling the inner energy of the body. And at that moment, I found within myself, I did not have to look for it outside. It was not coming from him, it was not coming from a teacher, it was not coming from a book, it was not coming from a seminar. It was not coming in the future. It was right now, here at this moment, I was feeling what I've always been looking for inside myself. I didn't understand it, I couldn't explain it, I couldn't describe it which I know now is the difference between all the other teachings that are out there. There's so many teachers say, oh, it's within, go within, go within, go within, present, be in the now. This is the only one event and that is now. And everyone talks about it. But it's not any of those things. It's not a thought of being inside. It's not a thought of stilling the mind. It's not the mind stilling the mind. It's impossible. It's not a psychic experience. It's not astral traveling. It's not a, a, an emotion. It is impossible to describe it. People have tried to name it God, try to name it love, try to name it conscious. It's beyond name. But it's unmistakable. And it's right there. It was my birthright all along, but it's so simple that I never even saw it until my mind stopped enough to hear somebody and to be in his presence because what I saw was I was able to get it through him 
because he was there. He provided that space, that empty space for me to walk into. And I realized that I couldn't get it from my other teachers because they weren't there. This is a very different kind of teaching. You, you can be a, a boxing coach without ever being in the boxing rink. You can be a, 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 a piano teacher without ever doing a concert. But this is not knowledge. This is not imparting knowledge or content. This is pure being with someone, being present with someone so that they can be present. You hold that space for them that they can walk into. And if he wasn't there, I wouldn't have been there. I wouldn't have gotten it. And that was a, quite a great revelation for me. And that was also confirmation that, yes, he, was, he wasn't fake. This was the truth. This is true. And now, looking back, I could see that all the other teachings that I was involved in were mind-based. The mind is very clever. The mind has invented all kinds of spiritual paths and all kinds of ways to do it with the mind. Because the mind, once you go into the body and you feel that presence, and once you're in the present moment, the mind can live there. It doesn't want to die. So it has to create its own spiritual path to keep you as far away from truth as it can. That was a, a, an incredible moment for me. Uh, the other great shock for me was that after that experience, I was just so overjoyed by having found it. And I thought, my God, this is so amazing. He looked at me and he said, I just want you to know, this is it. And I said, what do you mean? He said, no, this is the it. The it. What is the it? And he, he shook me. He said, no, this is it. This is it. There is nothing else. This is it. Okay. And I was shocked. I was, what do you mean this is it? You mean there's no other technique, other book, other seminar? I was already enrolled to a few other seminars, and, and I had all these books that I was ready to read. And What do you mean? No, this is it. There is nothing beyond this. What you feel, what you're experiencing right now, at this very moment, inside your body, that presence, is it. There is nothing else. There's no visions. There's no explosions. There's no kundalinis. There's no chakras. There's, this is it. There's nothing else that you need. There's nothing else to find. The search is an illusion. The, th the more I searched, the further I got from this is it, from home. The more I, I wandered, the, more, the further I was from, from my own birthright, my own home. With all the promises for a future attainment, and somebody else is going to give it to me, and it's out there, it's out there, it's out there. No wonder it was so hard, for, and no wonder it took so long and so much money. <laughs> I already owned it, for crying out loud. <laughs> It was mine to begin with. That <laughs> was, uh, was astonishing. It was, uh, the mind was disappointed. The mind wanted something flashy, like, you know, my teacher that was so creative and spoke such beautiful, elegant words and wore all those beautiful clothes and had all these musical parties in his home and the other teacher with the, you know, being a monk. Oh, it's so romantic to be a monk. Hmm. <clears throat> Or is it? <laughs> it was so simple, and it took 40 years to see how simple it is. The mind doesn't want to know that it's simple. We're complex people. We want to make things difficult. <laughs>